Welcome back everybody to the Urology Care Podcast. Today we're going to be discussing some bladder health exercises to keep bladder health in check and as good as it can be. So I want to have our guest introduce herself right now. Hi, I'm Dr. Casey Kowalik and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Kansas uh, in the Department of Urology. Can you just begin by telling us a little bit about why working out can be a great way to keep fit and also help make your bladder stronger potentially and or improve bladder symptoms? Yeah, of course. And I want to thank you two so much for having me on the podcast. And I think this concept of unhealthy bladder is so important. Um, There's uh, been several factors that have been identified that can influence bladder health, um, and certainly educating um, patients about this knowledge um, will help them um, promote a healthy bladder. And so the bladder muscle uh, is called the detrusor muscle, and it's actually not a skeletal muscle, meaning that it differs from the other muscles like your biceps or your quadriceps muscles. And so you can't actually do exercise that specifically target the the detrusor muscle. However, your organs are supported by your pelvis, which has your pelvic floor muscles. And those are skeletal muscles, which means that they can be targeted for exercise. So women that are listening are probably familiar with the concept of Kegel exercises to help improve stress urinary incontinence. And Kegel exercises are one type of exercise that can strengthen and target those pelvic floor muscles. Um, So in short, you can't actually make your bladder stronger, but you can strengthen the surrounding pelvic floor muscles, which will ultimately help to improve your urinary symptoms and overall bladder health. Before we move on, is there anything else you want to mention about Kegel exercises and or how they're done? Yeah, so um, Kegel exercises, there's a lot of good online resources, and actually the Urology Care Foundation has a good resource on this. Um, but basically what we tell women uh, to do is to learn how to contract your pelvic floor muscle. And so one time while you're avoiding, we want you to interrupt that urine stream. And you doing that is actually contracting your pelvic floor muscle. Now, I don't want you to do this repeatedly while you're actually avoiding. Just do it once to get the sense of where those muscles are and how to contract them. And then separately at you know, identified times during the day when you want to strengthen your pelvic floor muscles, you can do 10 slow contractions of that muscle. And if you do that even just once or twice a day, over time, you're going to notice that you have uh, increased strength of those pelvic floor muscles. I want to ask about the importance of mild or low impact exercises. This can be yoga, swimming, bicycling, What is the importance of low-impact exercising for bladder health? Well, low-impact exercises are a great way to get in exercise while minimizing the risk of having urinary incontinence while you're exercising. These exercises can actually strengthen your core muscles as well as your pelvic floor muscles and help to relieve pressure um, in your pelvis and on your bladder. Additionally, exercising can help maintain a nice, healthy weight, which will in turn also keep your bladder healthy and um, decrease the chances of experiencing urinary incontinence. How might exercises such as lifting heavy weights, doing jumping jacks, things of that nature, how does that raise your chances of leakage? Yeah, so those types of exercises, um, anything that involves jumping or um, lifting heavy weights will increase your intra-abdominal pressure. And it adds pressure to your pelvic floor. So anytime that you're straining during exercising, that's going to increase that pressure to your pelvic floor. And that will increase your chances of experiencing a stress urinary incontinence while you're exercising. Um, so while we generally recommend pelvic floor strengthening exercises to help prevent stress urinary incontinence, um, it is always a good idea to use the bathroom right before working out. Um, particularly particularly if you're going to be doing um, these high-impact exercises. That way, um, you can ensure that your bladder is empty and and help reduce the risk of having a stress incontinence episode. What about staying hydrated? Perhaps someone is dealing with the symptoms of overactive bladder or they're just maybe not hydrating enough. 
What is your advice about hydration? My advice is really to listen to your body. If you're thirsty, drink some water. If you're not thirsty, you don't have to force yourself to drink water. But you do want to make sure that you're staying adequately hydrated while you exercise. Problem is, if you drink too much water and overhydrate, um, this can cause not only some stomach upset while you're working out, but it may also also cause you to have to use the bathroom um, much more frequently while you're working out. I want to ask about diet, diet advice. Is there any diet tips or something that people should be mindful about when it comes to eating and keeping their bladder health in check? Yeah, so some people have sensitivities to certain foods that can manifest as um, irritation in their bladder or even overactive bladder symptoms like frequency uh, and urgency of urination. And so foods that may contribute to lower urinary tract symptoms um, might include like alcohol, soda, caffeine, uh, some acidic foods like, like lemons and oranges, or even spicy foods. And the um, Urology Care Foundation also has a great resource on the effect of diet on bladder symptoms. And they have this uh, comprehensive list of foods that may affect your bladder. So this list is quite long. But not all foods affect all patients the same. And so you'll have to go through the diet and figure out what foods may be affecting you and your bladder. Can you tell me about what an elimination diet is and how that might impact someone's bladder health? So an elimination diet um, can be a first step to figure out what foods may be affecting your bladder and causing some irritative uh, bladder symptoms. How you do it is that you eliminate any potential cause for your urinary symptoms from your diet for one to two weeks. And so you could uh, look at that list that's on the Urology Care Foundation website and eliminate those foods that could potentially be affecting your bladder. If your symptoms improve while on the elimination diet, then likely there was something that you were eating um, that was affecting your bladder. And so after those initial two weeks of the elimination diet, then you slowly start to add back foods, one food at a time, and you test it for about 24 or 48 hours. If after adding back a food, you still are feeling good, not having any symptoms, then you can uh, likely safely say that this food is, is okay and not affecting your bladder. However, if you notice that after adding back a food, some of your symptoms return, and then probably that particular food um, is contributing to some of your bladder symptoms, and you may want to Either consider eliminating that food completely from your diet or at least limiting it. Um, I would say um, that you should speak with a physician prior to starting an elimination diet, as some people may have um, nutritional deficiencies and eliminating certain food groups, we wouldn't want to um, contribute to that further. Do you have any more final thoughts you want to leave us with before we wrap up today? Yeah, a couple things. Um, I also want to mention that bladder health is closely associated with the health of your bowel. And so making sure that you're staying hydrated, having a diet that's full of fiber with a goal of having a daily soft bowel movement will also help to keep your bladder healthy. And if you are a smoker, the best, best thing you can do for your bladder is to quit smoking. Um, studies have shown that up to 20 to 30% of bladder cancer in women is caused by smoking. And so please uh, consider seeking out resources to help you quit. And then the last thing I want to mention is some of the interesting work I've done um, when I was at Vanderbilt University as a fellow on the toileting behaviors of adult women. And one thing that really stood out to us was the number of women that adopt a non-sitting position when they use public toilets. And so the study found that at home, 99% of women sit on their toilet, but away from home, only 76% of women are actually sitting on the toilet. Uh, the other 24% are either hovering, squatting on the toilet, or standing over uh, the toilet to void. The relationship between adopting these non-sitting positions and voiding is not clear, um, but it could lead to uh, decreased relaxation of the pelvic floor, which would uh, prohibit complete emptying of the bladder. And so our current recommendation is to void in a position that you find comfortable, uh, so that you can maximally relax your pelvic floor muscles to promote efficient and effective bladder emptying. And at least in American culture, that is typically in a sitting position. 
Thanks for being on the podcast today. Can you just remind us one more time who you are and where you practice? Dr. Casey Kowalik, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Kansas in Kansas City uh, in the Department of Urology. This podcast has been brought to you by the Urology Care Foundation, the official foundation of the American Urological Association. For more information on today's topic and for all things urology health, visit urologyhealth.org. That's urologyhealth.org. Dot O-R-G.